Could Havlicek steal it? Havlicek stole the ball! Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! Hello, I'm Chris Fowler, and welcome to Sports Century. For so long, the face of the NBA had been smiling and non-threatening, from Julia Serving to Magic Johnson to Michael Jordan. And then came this representative of the hip-hop generation, a walking billboard of tattoos, braids, fixed scowl, and defiant attitude. Allen Iverson became a symbol of those on the outside, and a disquieting reminder that they exist. Check Yo, check them out. Uh -huh. Iverson, in many ways, is one of the uh, foremost representatives of hip hop culture in modern day America outside of rappers themselves. You know, the way he stepped on the basketball court, rocking the cornrows, rocking the tats. I'm here in this league. I'm bringing my friends with me. They may look scary to you because they wear hip hop clothing and some of them have records, but I'm going to be loyal to them and I'm going to stick by them. In 1996, Allen Iverson brought a heightened brand of playground brilliance to the NBA, but with it came a sharp level of street swagger. In the summer of 1997, he was arrested for possession of marijuana and a concealed weapon. Although the drug charge was dropped, and he was let off with 100 hours of community service when he pleaded no contest to having the gun, an impression remained. People see a threatening black man. I mean, Iverson says, hey, that's the environment I come from, that's the perspective I come from, and I don't care what you think. Here's a guy that's probably the first guy to wear braids on his hair in the NBA. Then he puts on his bandanas. And I said, what in the world are these conservative folks going to say? When Iverson cut a rap album in 2000 featuring sexually explicit material, the response, inside and outside the league, was so loud that the album was never released. If you are a hardcore hip-hop fan, then this album is for you. If you don't care about hardcore gangster rap, just don't buy it. He was naive in not expecting a backlash. But his argument is the people who were criticizing him didn't understand the art form. There's this incident of Allen on the cover of the NBA magazine when they airbrushed the tattoos and the guy says, hey, if you wanted somebody without tattoos, why didn't you just pick another player? I don't want this publicity. I'd rather not have it if you're going to take my image and make it, you know, fit what you want it to fit. I don't wear a suit before and after a game and I'm not clean cut and, and I get knocked for that. So all of a sudden I cut all my hair off and wear suits. Are you going to love me then? I'm still going to be the same person. Allen Iverson does what he feels like doing. If you try to get him to conform, that's when you're going to see the most resistance. You walk and say, boy, you wake up. Boy, you grasp what you need to not only your league, not only your team, to a generation. It's a small percentage, but it's a power percentage that want him to change. A large percentage of black America and younger white America, your AI do not change. Stay who you are. What's happened, interestingly enough, is in the culture at large, he transcended basketball and became a pop culture icon. Allen has crossed markets because if you look at the generation today, they're wearing tattoos, they all have do-rags, you see kids wearing cornrows. He played with a protective sleeve on his surgically repaired elbow, and if you take a look at playgrounds around Philadelphia, you see 13-year-olds wearing this long protective sleeve. He does it because it's a medical thing. They do it because it's an inner city style statement. It's like the hypocrisy of America when they're dealing with Allen Iverson. He's not trying to sell himself to America, but America wants him to sell himself to them. At some point in my life, I got tired of always defending myself, having to say who Allen Iverson is, because either you're going to accept it or you're not going to accept it. And I care, but I really don't care because 
All I need to concentrate on is the people that love me and care about me for who I am. The thing about him, I respect and admire, he's tough. If you hit him, he's going to keep coming back. I'm telling you, the little guy, he is something. He takes a beating. You have certain guys that you know that are going to weather the storm. And Allen is definitely one of those guys who, whatever you throw at him, he's going to take it on the chin, and he's still going to get up and give you 40 points. The irrepressible Allen Iverson, you cannot kill that guy. When a superstar goes down and then gets right back up, and instead of going to the side, pushes through, pushes through, because that, that really makes an effect on the, on the team. The pounding he takes, the injuries he has to his body, and for him just to keep getting up, getting up, getting up, I don't think there's anybody in professional sports pound for pound that's as tough as he is. That's something you can't take from nobody. It's just something some people have, some people don't. You gotta have that heart in the street, you know, and uh, he got it. Because of the game that I played, my size, my weight, people always said I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, and I've heard it all my life. And I always took that as a challenge. And it does have a lot to do with where I come from because I didn't suppose to make it out of the place that I made it out of. Here's a guy who's successful on his own terms. He's successful in spite of all the odds against him. All the circumstances of his life were such that he probably shouldn't have made it past a teenager. The roots of Iverson's toughness run deep, back to his birth on June 7, 1975, in the racial backwaters of Hampton, Virginia, near Newport News. Allen Iverson grew up in a tough neighborhood as the child of a teenage mother. His biological father had already left the family by the time Allen was growing up, and Allen's stepfather um, was also locked up for several years on drug charges. The violence he saw growing up, I mean, it started at eight years old when he witnessed his first murder. It was a commonplace occurrence in Newport News throughout his adolescence to sort of be among the crowd standing around a chalk outline of a body. A lot of the people that he really kind of counted on and, and looked to were killed. He had some very close friends growing up and a lot of them didn't make it out of there. Allen's brought up in a house where there's cousins, there's 13 kids in a couple bedroom house. There's chaos. There was raw sewage floating on the floor. And it's one of the reasons why Allen was always on the playgrounds till all hours of the night. The crossover move actually had rather tragic roots. At age three, his mother tells him that he's got to be the man of the house. By five, when he's jumped on by five kids and comes home to get a fishing rod to fight him off with, his mother stops it all and says, no, you go back there and fight them all one by one. So here's a cat that has to go out and find a way to make money when he still has to be at school eight hours a day. But still make sure that his sister, his baby sister, gets to school and gets to work. Still make sure that his mom is not out there on the streets getting caught up in anything that's out there. It was bad for me growing up, but I feel like sports was an outlet for me, you know, because it took my mind off a lot of things that I was dealing with. My mom told me I could be anything I wanted. And I told my friends, you know, I was going to be a professional athlete. And back then, they always used to laugh at me. They soon stopped laughing. At Bethel High School, Iverson gained statewide fame in two sports. Iverson will take it on the one hop, trying to get a block on the side. He had 30 foot range on his jump shot. He was a right handed tiny archibald in terms of handle, and he could jump through the rafters. So I could take MJ. Then we stopped, you said Michael Jordan. He said, I tell you what, if I get the ball, I think I could take him and score on him. I mean, he got that much confidence in his game. It's Man. Well, we played hard. We wanted this, man. First one. Feel good. 
Along the road to the state basketball championship in his junior year, Iverson's fame took a downturn when he became the focal point of a racially motivated brawl in a local bowling alley on Valentine's Day 1993. The allegation is that there was, the N-word said, that there was a racial epithet which ignited a melee. And in the course of the melee, uh, the violence done was extreme. Alan Iverson has never denied that he was involved in that. Some of the white kids were injured uh, much more severely than the black kids were. And there was a chair thrown that hit and injured someone. And it was Alan Iverson eventually who was said to have thrown the chair. There was supposedly a racial brawl, but only four black youths, two of them minors with no records, including Alan, were arrested and charged. They are charged with a statute called maiming by mob that was instituted to protect blacks from lynchings and now it's being turned against four young black men. A town was was immediately divided and the rhetoric was heightened. We want the national leadership of this country to come in here and help us get rid of racism. People in this city don't realize today that that was a frightening situation. That couldn't have been a burning Hampton. I did feel that what happened to the people that night at the court now. I don't want that to happen to nobody in this situation. Two people were knocked unconscious in the fight. Iverson was convicted and sentenced to 15 years, 10 of which were suspended. Man, that judge gave him that time. You would have thought that you were at a funeral of a slain leader. <laughs> uh, me, myself, I, I was crowned. I couldn't believe it. I was incredulous. After serving four months at the Newport News City Farm Correctional Facility, Iverson was granted clemency by Governor Douglas Wilder. Barred from playing high school basketball, Iverson earned a diploma at an alternative school. And although his conviction was overturned in 1995, the stigma attached to it remained feel that he was wrongly punished and because of that he has been on a mission from that day forward never to be knocked down by anybody in quote unquote the system again and I think that drives him more than anything else. It was tough for me when I got locked up because you know he say nobody makes it from Newport News, Virginia. I just said well I'm just gonna be one out of the million, one out of the billion. a guy whose trouble that he had in high school got a lot of attention. And the message, as I recall, that went out to college coaches was, uh, this is not a good guy. This is not a guy that you want to recruit. Ann Iverson went to John Thompson and said, listen, my son is a great basketball talent and he needs some help. She saw John Thompson as a, a strong uh, black man, a father figure. She broke down crying and told me that if I didn't help him, that her son would be killed. Under Thompson, Iverson was twice named Big East Defensive Player of the Year and earned All-American status when he averaged 25 points as a sophomore. Then he became the first Georgetown player to leave early when he entered the 1996 NBA Draft. The first pick goes to the Philadelphia 76ers. We had a draft day party where the spectrum was filled with maybe eight to 10,000 fans. And this was because everyone knew that we held the number one pick and it was going to be AI. Iverson has Jordan. The crowd is into it. Allen shakes great. Gets two. Although winning Rookie of the Year, the top NBA pick got low grades as a team player. I thought early in his career, he played more like a street ball, playground all-star. He's a great player. The only knock at him is that he's thinking only about himself. While Iverson averaged 24 points in 1997, the Sixers lost 60 games. That spring, Philadelphia hired a new head coach, purist Larry Brown. I know the right way to play, and I'm not afraid to tell the players to do that. I've never had a player like Allen. Um, I never saw a player like him, and I didn't look forward to the opportunity of coaching him. You have two people who are so different. guy who's in his 60s, white, old school. On the other hand, you have African-American, 
hip hop. You would literally see moments during a game where Larry Brown would take Allen Iverson out. He's only coming out for three minutes, four minutes, and Allen Iverson is about to have a heart attack. But that's why I got to a point where he would continuously curse at Larry Brown. Larry Brown would say, come on off the bench, and Allen Iverson would walk by about time, you know, about effing time. What does he do? He gets rid of everybody else and he keeps Allen. And the team is built paradoxically around the one player Larry feels least like he can coach. Although the Sixers steadily improved over the next three seasons, the relationship between old school and hip-hop continued to clash. It was rough because he's competitive, I'm competitive, he's fiery, I'm fiery, I want to win, he wants to win, he wants to do it his way, and a lot of times I feel like, you know, my way is the best way. Allen shows up late, the coach kind of can't help himself. He is going to say what he feels needs to be said, then Allen's going to react. I'm tired of everybody talking about my relationship with Allen Iverson. I, I wonder what your relationship would be with any employee that you might have who doesn't choose to come to work on time or doesn't choose to come to work at all. These were two men who refused to so much as sit in the same room together. Larry Brown said, unless you trade him, I'm gone. Allen Iverson said, if he's here, trade me. Allen, I can't defend you anymore. I mean, if you're going to bust the rules, I, I can't do anything about it, and you're going to be traded. Allen Iverson was traded. The deal was made. He was going to the Detroit Pistons. But that trade in the summer of 2000 wasn't consummated. When another deal, this one with the hapless Clippers, also fell through, Iverson, jolted by thoughts of playing for a perennial bottom feeder, started to rethink his relationship with Brown. He said, I realized you guys weren't thinking of trading me because of how I play on the court. Uh, you were thinking about trading because of the things that I can control. And he says, I'm willing to look to, to do those things, control those things, because I want to be in Philadelphia. The Sixers opened the season with 10 straight victories. Although Iverson continued to feud with Brown to a point where the coach considered quitting, all seemed forgiven in mid-season at the All-Star game. Where my coach? Coach Brown. Is he around? This, this is, you know, this is a tribute to Coach Brown. I thought it was like Rocky saying, Adrian! Adrian! It was great. The Sixers finished with the best record in the Eastern Conference as Iverson averaged a league-best 31 points and was voted MVP. In the playoffs, he led Philadelphia into the finals for the first time in 18 years. 101 to 99, Iverson against Tyrone Lue. Baseline right, he backs up, he fires two balls. He's way too good! You didn't see the tattoos, the cornrows, and the baggy clothes. What you saw was someone who fell down, bruised up body, but no broken spirit. You saw someone that you wished was on your team. Coach Brown is a Hall of Fame coach, and you know, by going through all of that we went through in the beginning, I think helped us. Although the Sixers lost to the Lakers in five games, Iverson's gritty leadership not only won the approval of most Philadelphia fans, it demonstrated that he had bought into some old school wisdom. But after early playoff exits in 2002 and 2003, Brown bolted for Detroit, leaving the 165 pound Iverson to face a future without the coach who helped turn his game from a liability into an asset. If you read about Allen, or you see some news clips, it's easy to get one impression of him. I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, listen, we're talking about practice. If you actually take the time to find out what he's about, you'll understand this guy. He's really a deep person. He's not as shallow as people make him out to be. He's not just a creative force in terms of basketball. He's a caricature artist. And when he's done playing basketball, he's going to concentrate on his art. I had some friends over at my house. Alan came over. At the end of the night, God came over to me and said, Wow, I had no idea that this guy was this nice. And, you know, he sat up and he talked to my son. And in my mind, I'm saying, you know, this guy's always like that. If you never talked to Allen Iverson or been around Allen Iverson at all, how can you judge me? By what you read, by what you see on TV? But after winning his third scoring title, Iverson jumped from the sports section to front pages across the nation in the summer of 2002. He reportedly threatened two men after what was described as a domestic dispute with his wife, Tawana. 
allegedly threw her out the house. She went with her friend, his cousin. And two days later or so, he's looking for her because she hasn't been home. The initial complaint was that he went to his cousin's apartment because he believed that she was there and that in the course of looking for her threatened the cousin and the cousin's companion. And police claimed that the witnesses claimed that he had had a gun with him. It's not about him being a star athlete. It's about that he nor anyone else has the right to do what was done at that hour. A comparatively minor legal complaint just overnight morphed into a cause celeb media feeding frenzy. Mr. Iverson, can we ask you some questions? Uh, I was crucified during the whole time for those couple weeks helicopters flying around my house and just living with the fact that something I didn't do, I could spend up to 70 years in prison for it. Iverson was slammed with 14 charges that included threatening the two men with a gun. Although all the charges were dropped when his accuser's testimony didn't hold up in court, Iverson publicly hit back. He said that at the time he believed that there were police in Philadelphia who were out to get him and that he had heard that there were cops who were toasting what they called his next arrest. He did feel occasionally that he wasn't safe in Philadelphia and that he might be set up by a crooked police officer. First time I talked publicly with my wife to talk about the incident that happened this summer, the headlines was about the Philadelphia police officer. It was an hour and 30 minute interview and we talked about the police five minutes, if that. I wasn't talking about all police officers in general. I was just talking about a couple of bad apples. Allen has always polarized people. People that like Allen think the cops are out to get him. The people that hate Allen think that he's a criminal waiting to happen. I and mean, so it just reinforced the stereotypes that both sides hold. Everything that revolves around Allen generally becomes sensational. Everybody wants something to change. And if you're Alan Iverson, you can't listen to everybody. Larry Brown has a great expression. He's got to figure some things out for himself. He says it a number of times. He's still going to make mistakes. But I think the kid really cares. He has a lot to give. Alan has not taken the cue. He has not grown up. Inside of his manly body, is still a little kid. With all the greatness, he still doesn't get it. I'm not sure if he's grown and matured. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he's gotten the full impact of his stardom or responsibility. I don't think he's ever gotten that. At 27, he's still young, but he's, he's gone through the life of a 45-year-old individual. He just doesn't smile as much. You know, not that he's not happy, he's just tired, man. I don't want to be the bad boy of the NBA. I don't want that label. Maybe people think I'm a thug and I want to be that, and I know by me saying it, it's just not going to be enough, but hopefully I got a long life to live and people can start to understand me a little bit more. For all his stated desire to change his image, trouble continued to follow Allen Iverson. In the early morning of April 14, 2003, two shots rang out in front of a Philadelphia nightclub. One bullet struck Larry Robinson, a business associate of Iverson, in the leg. According to police, the 76er guards stood nearby. Coach Larry Brown said, it's a different world. Perhaps, but it's one that Iverson knows all too well. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.